Hi, my name is Sarah and I like books. There's a trend going on right now in specifically bookish spaces where people will share the most upsetting, gross, violent, and uh, downright gory books that they've read. And this is both recommendations and also a warning that their audiences should beware because these books can and will ruin your day. I adore this trend because I love extreme horror. I uh, absolutely love books that are unhinged and really will stick with you. I actually have a favorite subgenre of extreme horror, which is splatterpunk. Splatterpunk is a movement within extreme horror that often hinges on things that are violent, gory, usually pretty transgressive, and ends up being pretty countercultural. Uh, the term was coined in 1986, but the movement itself has been around since the early 80s. Um, it did reach kind of a peak in the mid 90s and has since faded away, um, but recently has gone through a little bit of a renaissance, almost 40 years later after it was originally kind of coming into popularity. I think that that's super cool. Um, I absolutely eat this up. I love the, uh, the most upsetting books. I love stuff that sticks with you because it's upsetting. I wanted to read five splatterpunk books that I have not read before. Um, there's no rereads in this one. I have obviously read around this genre a bit, but these are all new for me for the first time. Most of these books are novella length. There's one that is longer, but all of them are pretty short. The books I ended up picking up are Audition by Ryu Murakami, uh, Womb by Duncan Ralston, and I have an e-reader version of that one, You've Lost a Lot of Blood by Eric LaRocca, Fluids by Mae Leitz, and Exquisite Corpse by Poppy Z. Bright. I may be referring to Poppy Z. Bright as Billy Martin, which is um, the name that uh, he has since changed his name to uh, after the publication of Exquisite Corpse. Um, don't let that confuse you. There's not a secret sixth author in here. Uh, Billy Martin has, has since uh, legally changed his name. So those are the five books that I picked up and I have a lot of opinions. Um, so let's get started. I'll be discussing the plot of these books, so if you really want to skip a certain book because you want to go in unspoiled, um, I'm going to either be holding the book or have it up on screen while discussing it. So um, I I'm also going to put timestamps down below, but that's a pretty good indicator of if I'm going to be spoiling the book, is if I'm holding it. The first book I'm going to talk about is Audition. Um, Yes, this is the audition that inspired the 1999 film that then went in turn inspired the torture genre of uh, horror films. Being careful with how I refer to that. Uh, and I, ooh, ooh, this one, it's infamous. So found the novel version of it, the original, and was really excited to give it a try. So this follows Ayawama, who is a 42-year-old widower. Um, several years prior to the start of the book, his wife has passed away from cancer. Um, and his teenage son, Shihei, is asking him why he hasn't remarried. Uh, this, in turn, causes the events of the book. So good job, kid. Good job. Ayawama and his friend Yoshikama, uh, who's kind of like a scummy film producer, um, they discuss this question, why hasn't he remarried, over several drinks. Over a lot of drinks. They're very drunk. And um, they formulate a plan. And um, their plan is as follows. They are going to hold a fake film audition this is for a film that they have no intention of ever making. And 
they're going to have a bunch of women audition essentially for the role of Ayoama's next partner. Uh, you can see where this is going. And enter Asami. Asami seems perfect to play the role of former prodigy, um, tragic main character, because she is one. Um, she is a tragic former prodigy, a, a ballerina to be exact, and she danced for years and it helped her overcome a lot of her trauma from childhood. And she had to stop due to a, a debilitating injury. So she is a perfect fit and they hit it off and continue to see each other and get to know each other and go on dates. Obviously the film falls through. They never had any intention of actually making it. Uh, they use the guise that they were unable to find people willing to pay for it, uh, which valid, it wasn't a real film. This doesn't stop Asami and Ayawama from seeing each other though. They go on a lot of dates. They get really close and Honestly, their chemistry is kind of nice. Um, they talk a lot about some very interesting subjects and Ayawama is smitten, but his friend um, Yoshikawa is finding little inconsistencies in her story. Things like the fact that her former mentor was murdered, super cool. Or that her family is just unable to be contacted, um, also super cool. Uh, and and she continues to have weird reactions to kind of benign changes in conversation, especially around the idea of commitment, um, which fair enough, um, but they keep kind of getting brushed aside. Um, Ayawama does not want to hear Yoshikawa out. He doesn't care. He is looking through rose colored glasses. All those red flags, just flags. Um, important to note, in all the time they've been seeing each other, Ayawama has not mentioned that he's a father. Um, he's really close to his teenage son. In fact, he's a main character in the book. Uh, this is a very limited cast book and his son is essential. But he keeps forgetting to mention. It's not out of malice. He doesn't even really mean to keep forgetting <laughs> to mention his son, but he hasn't and that's important. Because you see, when he does mention that he has a son, Asami decides that this is deception and that this is a betrayal. And it marks Ayawama as her next victim. You see, Asami is a serial sadist. She will date a man until he lies to her, slights her, um, deceives her, has some kind of uh, transgression that she decides is bad enough that means that she will then break off the relationship, drug him, and cut off his feet at the ankles. Asami has a rocky childhood. She was pretty badly abused by specifically her stepfather, and her stepfather, before they ever met, had uh, both of his feet amputated um, below the ankles. So when she has a man that she thinks is bad enough, it reminds her of her stepfather, and that's that's the origin of her M.O. So Ayawama is in trouble. Um, I'll spare you the pretty graphic details, um, but Asami does indeed drug Ayawama, and in this scene she does pretty graphically kill the family dog. It's pretty upsetting. Um, I really am not a big fan of animal violence um, in books in general, so I'll spare you that, but it's it's not my favorite. Uh, heads up. Um, but she also cuts off one of Ayoama's feet. Super cool. Uh, it was described, it was pretty gross. And in the ensuing um, confrontation, Ayoama's son comes home. And in a true Chekhov's gun moment, he uses a weapon that he stashed earlier in the book to kill her in self-defense, saving his dad's life in the process um, because Ayawama almost certainly would have died of blood loss uh, had somebody not come and saved him. And that's where the book ends. There's no epilogue. That is the final scene of the book is the confrontation. 
So we really don't see how Ayuama would get along after what is certainly a pretty debilitating injury and a lot of trauma. A lot of trauma. That being said, undoubtedly my favorite part of this book is the conversations that Asami and Ayawama have on their dates. Um, these very quiet kind of moments uh, where they discuss specifically Japanese culture um, and the intersection between post-war Japan and the pre-war culture that they grew up on. I find these conversations absolutely fascinating. Uh, let me give you just a quick example. This is a conversation they're having about Japanese cuisine, of all things. Just, just cuisine. My theory is that sushi and kasuki are dishes that evolved in peaceful, prosperous times, when eating well was the normal state of affairs. In this country, we have the illusion that there's always this warm, loving community that we belong to, but the other side of that is a sort of exclusiveness and xenophobia. Our food reflects this. Japanese cuisine isn't inclusive at all. In fact, it's extremely inhospitable to outsiders, to people who don't fit into the community. That is a conversation that they're having at a restaurant um, that they're having a date at when discussing the culture around sushi counters. And it goes into the idea also of cultures with like warm and hot and spicy foods and it's very interesting. I think that this book's biggest strength is all of the quiet, insightful moments. Uh, the parts even before the gore and the horror, before this book even is a horror book. Like, yes, this is a very good book, but I almost wish by some fluke I had received a copy where Ayawama and Asami make it work. They figure it out and she heals from her trauma for real this time, and they live happily ever after. I kind of think under different circumstances, this would just be a cute romance novel, a, a kind of meet cute. But that's not how books work. The plot is set in stone and somebody must get hurt. Overall, I'm really glad that I read this book. Um, it is t the tamest of the five that I picked up, but if you're a fan of translated horror, I would definitely give it a shot. Uh, it is just on this side of extreme, so you're probably not going to lose your lunch while reading this, but overall, good experience. All right, next book. The next book up is going to be Womb by Duncan Ralston. Uh, oh, how am I even going to talk about this book? Uh, this one begins with Angel, our protagonist. Um, he arrives at room six of the Lonely Motel and immediately calls an escort service uh, and hires Shyla, our other main character for the night. Um, Angel then proposes a sort of way to pass the time um, while they prepare for the main event. <laughs> uh, and he wants to tell Shyla's stories that took place in the exact room of the motel that they're in. Oh, and oh man, those stories are some real doozies. <laughs> um, due to the nature of these stories and like also what's going on in the background, I, I really can't go into like gory detail with all of them, um, but I will give like a brief overview of what each section entails. Um, the first story is about a young man named Johnny and Jenny, his should-be ex-girlfriend. <laughs> Through a series of events and a lot of enabling, Jenny ends up in a lot of debt to a heroin dealer. Uh, they both are forced to smuggle a lot of the stuff across the border of America and Canada. Um, by the way, this entire book takes place in Buffalo, New York, so that's our about our setting. Um, there are some really wonderful and kind of gross descriptions of the human body as a piece of luggage and does the body remember the things it carries with it, kind of alluding to trauma but also alluding to physical things at the same time. Um, that being said, super gruesome story. Uh, Jenny ends up dying in room six. 
uh, because one of the bags of drugs um, does burst with inside of her and she then overdoses. Um, it's pretty bad. Johnny tries to save her, cannot. It's gross. Um, and overall, it's a story that doesn't have a lot in the way of like morals. But Angel continues to the next story, which involves Johnny again, uh, getting revenge on that heroin dealer uh, who caused his girlfriend's death by using the help of a sex worker that he is friends with and a lot of fake blood. I'm gonna skip this story in its entirety. Uh, you understand, I'm sure. But this is an important point. Um, Duncan Ralston, I, I personally am not an expert in the subject, but Duncan Ralston really seems to be writing sex workers as pretty sympathetic characters. He writes them as sympathetic people. And I actually found that I really enjoyed his portrayal of the different uh, characters in the book that filled that niche. Um, Shyla is one of my favorite characters that I have read in a horror book in a very long time. She just is awesome. So, um, important note, uh, I know that that is, that is very important to some people. Um, once again, not an expert, but I liked the portrayals. Uh, the next story is about a newly single woman's struggle to obtain an abortion. Um, the sexual assault she suffered is importantly not described on page. Uh, actually, let me elaborate on that for a moment. There's a lot of weird sex stuff in this book. Uh, I've heard it described as psychosexual. And there is some stuff with questionable consent for sure but there is no on-page rape at all. There are two characters that for sure have suffered sexual assault or rape, but their, their assault is not in the present. It is not detailed. It is not narrated. And I just thought that was really important to mention that in this entire book, we, we are given glimpses at what happened, but we are not shown in graphic detail. So, uh, still, still going to be a hard read, uh, but not for that reason. But yes, Mary is seeking an abortion, uh, in the year 1980 and she is too far along. Uh, no one will perform one. So she goes to the lonely motel and she is in room number six, obviously, um, writes a letter to her unborn child and then attempts to end her pregnancy. Um, this doesn't, go well um it's it's pretty bad it's she fails really badly and it's really hard to read uh mary does die in that room but her child survived the procedure and goes into the system and continues life um starting his life as an orphan so that sucks uh it's a super hard read for sure but very important to the story uh, at this point, it is Shiloh's turn to tell a story. She only tells one, um, and she tells the story about the strangest client she ever met, um, the Smother Man. Uh, once again, I'm sure you can understand that I really can't talk about this one a lot. Um, it's really graphic, not, not safe for YouTube, but love Shyla. She is an awesome character. Angel tells another story, uh, this one about a man who goes through like a rebirthing process um, that involves him calling up a cult and getting rolled in a rug and then having to wriggle his way out of the rug, simulating a birth, um, but he almost dies. He, he cannot get out of the carpet. He almost suffocates. Um, it's pretty scary. The important part about this, this is the only story that Angel tells that does not take place in room six at all, but Shyla puts the pieces together. Uh, this is a story about Angel. <laughs> Some kind of pieces fall into place for her. They take a little bit of a break from some of the stuff going on in the background that I unfortunately can't describe. And Angel starts his last story. This is the story that links everything together. And it is so upsetting. Um, this is the story of Angel's first love. This is the story of his first love and her obsession with a mannequin. Yeah. Uh, 
her psychosexual trauma that led her to permanently disfiguring her date, uh, Johnny. Oh yeah, did I mention? Johnny and Angel are the same person. All of these stories have been about Angel. Uh, what about the pregnant woman, you may ask, though? That one wasn't about Angel. Yes, it was. <laughs> Remember? The baby survived. Angel's mom died in room six. His ex-girlfriend, Jenny, died in room six. The revenge he took on the drug dealer took place in room six. And this final story will take place in room six. Everything that he has gone through has been his attempt at a fresh start, a, a rebirth. And honestly, Shyla is his final attempt. He desperately wants a fresh start from his life. He wants to be reborn. Um, this book is really weird, okay? And it's really, really gross. It is thoroughly splatterpunk. Um, it's got a lot of really cool themes though about like rebirth and about how our bodies remember trauma and about how our actions have a ripple effect. Um, and honestly, it's kind of a beautiful book. It is short, it's grotesque, and it has a lot of very dark sexual content. You can snag it on Kindle Unlimited, at least you could whenever I purchased it. And honestly, I would absolutely give it a read. I really loved the way that Ralston described a lot of the feelings that Angel had. And I can't recommend this book per se to a lot of people, but if you think that you can handle it and you think it's for you, you should absolutely give it a try. All right, next book. This is the story of Martyr Black, a serial killer, and his partner, Ambrose Thorne. This is kind of meant to be read as a post-mortem after the fact, uh, like a collection of works associated with a true crime event, almost. Um, these are meant to be a collection of works associated with uh, Martyr Black and his crime. It's meant to be like a collection of poetry penned by Martyr, um, a short novella um, that is interspersed within here by the same title, You've Lost a Lot of Blood, um, that Martyr wrote, as well as like audio transcripts between him and Ambrose um, that have been edited over by Martyr at some point also. It, it's very interesting, super um, experimental. It's really cool. It's kind of a unique experience and it's kind of difficult to talk about the plot itself because of the way that it jumps. So let me start with the novella within a novella, You've Lost a Lot of Blood. These segments follow Tamsin, who is a graphic designer um, and she is a concept artist who is working for a video game developer, Mr. Zimpago. This is somebody that she has been following since the beginning of his career, and she has been tasked with finishing his cult classic game, You've Lost a Lot of Blood. Layers, am I right? <laughs> well, she and her younger brother, Presley, uh, find themselves staying at the Zimpago estate um, so she can work there. And she is working under Abba Zimpago's sister, Iris, as Abbas is currently unresponsive. He's in a coma. The house is weird. And Tamsin keeps seeing these kind of mechanical specters, these creatures that are almost body horror, but have a lot of wires and gears and are weird and upsetting. And worst of all, when they test the VR function for the game, Presley disappears into the code of the game. He is sucked into the actual game itself with no trace. It's honestly a lot to take in, and I wish I could say that it ended well, but the conclusion of the novella within a novella, You've Lost a Lot of Blood, is that Tamsin discovers that she can never leave the Zimpago home, and that they are stuck in a sort of time loop that Iris Zimpago this whole time has been the previous version of herself. And she takes up the mantle as Iris Zimpago 
as she looks out of the window of the residence, she sees the car coming up um, and she goes down to greet the next version of Tamsin and Presley. And the loop starts over. <laughs> Trippy, right? So what about the rest of the book? Well, as it turns out, Martyr didn't write the novella. Um, he also didn't write the poetry. He stole it all from his victims. Ambrose confronts him about this and stabs him in the neck and then fittingly tells him, oh, you've lost a lot of blood, my love. Layers, am I right? And that kind of brings us to the main point of the story. Is there such a thing as originality? Let me read you an example. Sometimes things don't have to be didactic. A story can just be a story. Sounds like a plagiarized account of a better story. Plagiarism implies that there's such thing as originality. You believe plagiarism doesn't exist? I don't believe in originality. Take, for example, our art form, the slaughtering of precious young men with their future spread out in front of them. There is nothing original about the way in which I dispatch them. If this were a story, it would be mundane, trite at best. But there is such thing as plagiarism. It is a construct invented by academia, has no bearing in the real world, unless you're a writer. As interesting as a discussion as this is to have, where does inspiration begin and plagiarism end? Is there truly an original story left? As you can see, I got quite a bit out of a small page count with my tabs. This has some really great body horror, some really genuinely good poetry, uh, quite a fun, novella within a novella and a great message uh, that has no black and white answer and it's totally up for you to decide how you feel about the subject. Uh, overall, I love Eric LaRocca. Um, this is absolutely worth it. If you can get your hands on it, pick it up. Super good. Um, really happy that I included this. On to the next book. So, the next book is uh, Fluids by Mae Leitz. Um, this is one of my favorite things I own. I purchased it from her band camp. Um, she is also a YouTuber. You may know her on here as Nick's Fears. Um, she writes books, she does music, she's awesome. I will be linking her band camp down below so that you can purchase for yourself. I do feel the need to mention, uh, in my content warnings, I put transphobia. Um, this is not unchallenged transphobia by any stretch of the imagination. This is like real world examples of trans people having a hard time of things as written by a trans person. Um, so don't worry too much. It's not, this is not transphobic. It's not unchallenged. It's just like life sucks. <laughs> so, so fluids, right? Um, so this is the story of Lauren, uh, a girl who is having a personality crisis and Dahlia, a trans woman uh, who is really just trying to seek solace from an uncaring and cruel world and um, how their paths intersect. Um, they meet on an online dating site and Lauren is completely obsessed with Dahlia um, and also obsessed with the idea of saving her from her life. Dahlia is just looking for acceptance and safety and Lauren wants to literally steal her away from her life um, and drives cross state in the middle of the night to arrive in her hometown to take her away from her home without asking and without clearing with her. And she also doesn't super know where she lives and it's, it's too much girl. Lauren, it's too much. Lauren convinces Dahlia to come with her anyway. So Dahlia starts a small fire in her closet, very minor, and skedaddles out of there with her. Um, they drive to a casino with the intention to scam somebody uh, and rob them. Um, this is once again, Lauren's idea, shocker, I know. And here's where I'm gonna get on my soapbox. Dahlia is amazing. She is I know I said this about the last book too. Dolly is legitimately one of my favorite horror characters I have read in a very long time. Um, and she goes through so much in this book. She is constantly being put into peril, specifically by Lauren. She is put into situations that are dangerous to her as a trans woman 
so, so frequently. Lauren even mentions that she is very uneducated as to the struggles that trans women go through. And yet she feels compelled to be the hero and is putting Dahlia in spaces that are just unsafe. She really thinks she can be this girl's knight in shining armor and acts without thinking, it crosses boundaries constantly. And honestly, Dahlia deserves better. And I know that that's what the book is about, but like, Dahlia deserves better. <laughs> and honestly, I'm not gonna tell you any more about the plot because I want you to go read this book. I really want you to go read this book. If you like splatterpunk, if you like extreme horror, you have got to go pick this one up for yourself. It's gross and gory and honestly weird and beautiful. It's well worth every penny <laughs> and every second you will spend with it. And I would love to go more into the plot because I love this book. This is one of my favorite books I've read this year so far. But I don't want to be the reason why anybody skips out on buying May's book. I just, I don't want to be, I don't want to be that reason. However, I will give you one of my favorite quotes from this book. And as you can see, I, I got quite a bit out of a pretty, pretty short book. Um, there are lots of things in this book I wish I could read you, but I'm just gonna pick one. Sometimes change hurts us. It asks us to do more than we feasibly can, and it stretches us like a muscle. Growth is painful in the same way decay is. We all think it's impossible to decay when it's only the natural growth process in reverse. We've already been through it. We are all begging for that change, but none of us can do it for ourselves, and it always hurts. This is a story about being strong enough to grow and about being strong enough to save yourself in the end. So yes, please read this book if it sounds like it's up your alley. I uh, Once again, I will leave the link to this book and May's Bandcamp page down below. If you want to purchase it for yourself, you absolutely should. All right, final book. And my... Uh, last five star read. This is one of the best books I have ever read. This is the story of Andrew Compton, who is a UK based serial killer, and Jay Byrne, um, who is a cannibal <laughs> um, and necrophile from New Orleans. Starting strong, I know. Compton has escaped his UK prison and is in New Orleans to evade capture and also to like continue killing. Don't worry, he still wants to kill. And Jay has his eyes set on a new target, a young Vietnamese man named Tran, but he resists the urge to kill and eat him because Tran is a local and doing that to locals is how you get caught. M meanwhile, Tran is also in the midst of his own crisis because he has just been kicked out of his home and his ex-boyfriend Luke has been diagnosed with HIV. Um, important to note, this book was released in 1996 and it takes place in the American South in the early 90s. And it's a rough time. Also, this book was written by a Southern trans man. So it's, it's pretty dark, it's pretty dire, and it's got a really um, upsetting look at what people were really going through at the time. Um, so yeah. And also Luke is there and he's running a pirate radio station with two other boys who have been diagnosed with HIV and going through that while also not really being over his ex-boyfriend Tran. Over the course of our book, our two serial killers meet up and it ends up being like a match made in hell. Um, I am underselling how just absolutely hilarious this segment is. They both are trying to kill the other before deciding that they are absolutely meant to be. It's, it's genuinely deeply funny. Andrew wears Jay down and they do decide to kill Tran together as an expression of love. This one is really gross. Um, I don't think I have ever read more graphic descriptions of rot and decay. Um, there is a reason why this one is a splatterpunk classic. But what I really got out of this was instead the heartbreaking reality 
of being queer in the 90s. This book is angry. More than angry, it's vindictive. I just, Luke says at one stage, I don't want to redesign the world. I want it to burn down with me. And you know what? I get it, right? Like, this is a bleak look at the AIDS crisis and queer persecution in the late 80s and early 90s. And honestly, it is a lot to digest. Like, yeah, the murder and necrophilia and rot and decay are hard to stomach, but not nearly as much as the hopelessness that this book conveys. The cops at one point turn a complete blind eye to trans abduction. And it, homelessness is a constant worry for him. And that's not even touching on the medical violence and the drug abuse that is stock standard in this book. And I mean, listen to this. Anyway, what are you doing here? Did your family kick you out? <laughs> yeah, for starters, how'd you guess? Soren rolled his eyes. Gee, I only know about 20 other queers that's happened to. You'll be okay. If they disrespect your basic identity enough to kick you out, they were damaging you anyways. They're Vietnamese. They don't understand being gay. Bullshit. Queers exist in every culture in the world. It's just that most cultures try to sweep them under the carpet. You can bet they're gay Vietnamese. You're one. There is a point in this book in which I have a tab that I have written on, I wish Luke would live long enough to be less angry. I think that that's my biggest takeaway, is that sometimes life is short and you are angry. This is a pretty hard read, but it's a classic for a reason and it's absolutely fantastic. If you think you can stomach it, Exquisite Corpse by Poppy Z. Bright, best book I've read this year. So where exactly does this leave us? What's the takeaway? Uh, the world is full of graphic and terrible violence. Uh, life is short and awful. No, <laughs> uh, I don't think it's anything quite so pessimistic as that. Every single one of these books used horror and violence to share something deep and profound and honestly a, a pretty interesting message. Something like growth or perseverance or originality or just the honesty of sharing cultures. It's not just blood and gore. Okay, well, it's, it's a lot of blood and gore, but between the murders, uh, there's a whole lot of love and art and meaning in these books. That's why I think this will always be my favorite genre. Uh, it always leaves me both deeply, deeply horrified and also like thinking about the bigger picture and thinking a little bit deeper. Thank you for uh, hearing me wax poetic about Splatterpunk. Thank you for watching. I'll see you next time.